Matthew 10, our verse, our text will be verse 5 to verse 7, but we won't be there just yet. The title is The, the Demand of a Disciple. The Demand of a Disciple. What's needed for everyday practical Christian living is simple instruction from the Scripture, spelled out in elementary words that we can understand. We're stupid. <laughs> I feel like you mentioned it in Sunday school. What Peter said, Peter said, you know, Paul writes some things that are pretty hard to understand. What we need as Christians to live every day is the simple things. The clear, concise instruction from the scripture. I'm just going to give you a taste of it. In Song of Solomon, he says this, the little foxes that spoil the vines. Okay, we can understand that. Little fox foxes will spoil your vine. Okay, so the little things have to be taken care of. That's a simple phrase. Here's another one. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, that's simple words. I can understand that. You want light? It's found in one place, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here's one in Ephesians. He says, neither give place to the devil. Clear, concise instruction in simple words. I like that. Here's another one. Pray without ceasing. Okay? Clear instruction, convicting, and simple, but not easy to do. <laughs> that's what we need to get through this life. And that's not heavy doctrine. That's not theological. You know, you don't write a treatise on that. That's something you're convicted of daily to get your walk right. The demand of a disciple. This is what Jesus is doing when he's on earth. Matthew 10, look at verse 7. Matthew 10, verse 7. He says, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I could teach on that for many hours doctrinally and say why he's saying this and to whom he's talking and not talking. But that's not what I'm talking about today. Today I'm talking about your practical everyday living. And we'll use this verse and find out how we get through this life with the right attitudes and the right instruction from Scripture. In 1912, Otto Warnweeder invented the first loaf-at-a-time bread slicing machine. You know, we think of that as being just a normal everyday item. When we say bread, we think of a bread slice. That was not the case back in 1912. In the early 1900s, the normal thing was you got a knife out and sliced your own loaf. Of course, Mama was probably making the loaf. <laughs> right. But then a big company came along in 1930 called Wonder Bread. <laughs> and they started using the slicing this bread thing machine, new invention, and made it all the rage because they had the advertising power behind them to market it. And now, today, we think it's a necessity. The product was just as good in 1912 as it was in 1930, but suddenly everybody recognized it. What made the difference is the marketing. Many things are the same way. You think about 200 years ago, some of the things we took for granted were not available. Electricity. Here's one. Writing paper. I know the young people don't use writing paper. They use a uh, some kind of product. However, I use writing paper. You know, it wasn't writing paper back in the early 1900s. It was a slate. And when, from 1700 to about 1900, it was the slate. That was what students used. And that was practical. They could erase it. And, you know, write on it with chalk and erase it and be done. Paper, they were against when it first came out because that ink is going to get everywhere. And it was a little ink well, and I'm sure that had plenty of disasters. <laughs> However, now we couldn't live without paper and pen and uh, deodorant. <laughs> we think that's a necessity. For many years, they didn't. Uh, electric lighting, cell phones, the list just goes on and on. Paul says it this way, just having something good is not good enough. It has to be proclaimed. He says this, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. If they're lost, they won't know it till somebody tells them they're lost. The demand of a disciple, Matthew 10, look back at verse 5. Matthew 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any, any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. 
but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first step in this process of discipleship is, I call a scary command, preach. That is, you know, a lot of people say, I don't want to preach. Well, you're commanded to. You better, you better uh, find a way to um, become a preacher. That doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a big mega church, but preach something. As a matter of fact, everybody does preach something, whether they realize it or not. But preach something biblical. Don't be a false preacher. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, the Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So preach something powerful. Okay, the cross. That's a good thing to preach. Here, first command Jesus gives the disciples is go out and get ready to preach. You're going to be doing some preaching. Now, if you're not preaching, you're not a disciple. You're not a good one. In 1 Corinthians 1, 21, he says this, for after, that the world, for after that in the wisdom, or after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, the tongue, to, tongue twister. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That is, don't shirk preaching. God says, that's what I'm using to save people with. So you know what the devil comes along and does? He convinces a person it's cool not to preach. Baloney. That's what God said I'm going to use. God says the world thinks it's foolish. That's why I'll use it. In Titus 1.3 he says this, But hath in due times manifest his word through preaching. That is, there's a transaction that, ex that transpires when someone is preaching. God manifests... <laughs> His word. I didn't say how big the congregation was. Could be one person. But if you preach it, then God will get in there and manifest his word. It'll make that word make sense. The Holy Spirit gets involved in it. If you'll accept this, accept this scary challenge to preach, then the next step is this. A simple course. Scary command and a simple course. Who's your audience? According to our verse, he says, preach when... And where? As you go. That is, you don't build something, it's as you go. In your day-to-day -day life, as you move and as you walk, that's your crowd. You don't have to go to a faraway mission field. I mean, that's great if some people do. However, a lot of people would run away to one rather than do the one that's right around them. He says, as you go, preach. Go into the way of the Gentiles. He says, don't go in the way of Gentiles. That is, you're going out of your way to go to the Gentiles. you got people right here you can preach to. And guess what? They're lost. So you've got to recognize there's a difference between saved and lost. And the mission field is not the one that's way far away. It's the one right in front of your face. <laughs> Jesus showed up preaching this same message 600 years prior to this. Get in Ezekiel 2. Ezekiel 2. Ezekiel 2 verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee unto the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this day. Ezekiel's message, go preach to Israel. Same thing Jesus showed up saying. Don't be thinking about some faraway land and the Gentiles. Go preach to your rebellious neighbors. You know, that's harder to do. If I go preach to somebody that doesn't know me, no big deal. But if I'm going to preach to the person who's seen me every day, that's a little more difficult. Look down at verse 6. Ezekiel 2, 6. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and storms, storm, thorns be with them. And thou dost what, uh, dwellest among um, scorpions. He's got a high opinion of these people. Be not afraid of their words, nor dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. That is, it's going to be a scary proposition to go preach. If you're willing to do it, that's the first step. The next step is open your mouth and then watch fear come flying in. Verse 7, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. He says, you're going to speak my word and don't Change your message based on whether or not it's well-received. 
God says, I don't care if they receive it or don't receive it. I want to give them the option. And you're the mouthpiece I'm using. He didn't tell the mouthpiece to decide when and what to say. He says, no, you speak it, and you speak what I say. Therefore, it takes all the brain work out of it for us. <laughs> you don't have to write a new book of the Bible. You speak the one that's already there. Your message is not a social gospel. That's what most people are preaching now. Because social changes on a day-to-day -day basis. We can always find some offended people that we want to pat on the back and make them feel better. That's not what the Bible does. The Bible says, no, all of you are going to hell. Hmm. How's that for patting you on the back? But we've got one answer. If he can consider everybody lost, then he's got one answer for everybody, and that's Jesus Christ. Not only that, it's a sermon of conviction. He says, as you go preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is, it's a limited time offer. It's at hand, but it won't be for long. Every man's got a short time to make a decision. Matter of fact, you've only got a short time on this earth. He says in Acts 26, Acts 26 verse 17, he says, Deliver, Acts 26 verse 17, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And he said something there. He's telling you about this message you're taking. You're taking a message people don't want to hear. It's going to be convicting. Therefore, the Holy Spirit's got to get involved in it, or you're going to be very hated. You're going to be viewed as um, an angry hater because you're teaching you can get forgiveness of, I want you to look at what it says. What are you getting forgiveness of? Sins, plural. You know how most people would say that? Sin, singular. He didn't say sin, singular. That's true. You are a sinner and you need to be saved from being a sinner. You need to change your classification, but you need something else too. You've got individual sins that you need forgiveness from. That's missed in modern Christianity. Modern Christianity wants to make it comfortable. You're a sinner and God will save you from being a sinner. What makes you a sinner? Being one who commits sins, plural. Identify. What have you, how have you offended God? That message right there makes people uncomfortable. That's a convicting message. However, it's only God that they've sinned against. You don't sin against man. You sin against God. Therefore, it's only God that can forgive you. So, that's a convicting message. That's message number one. The Bible's full of convicting messages. Let's look at a few of them. Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 5. He says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. There's that at hand thing. It's a limited time offer. The clock is ticking. That is, the disciple is supposed to demonstrate that he serves someone. It's Jesus Christ. That's a sermon of conviction for the Christian. That is, you've got a master, you should look like it. A Christian should, there should be certain things a Christian cannot do that the world can. And the world ought to recognize it. The world ought to recognize that your speech is different. Why? Because somebody's, not because you don't know how to speak like a sailor. <laughs> That's not it. And it's not because you don't have an urge to from time to time. It's because somebody's controlling your lips that ain't you and ain't them. Be someone who's in um, control, moderation. The Lord's at hand. That is, you've got a small time to prove this. We got 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. He says that you be not soon shaken in mind or, or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Hmm. There's no time to be sidelined by emotions and every wind of doctrine that blows around. This is a sermon of conviction to the Christian. He says the day of Christ is soon to appear. It's at hand. Clock is ticking. It won't be long. Therefore, as far as a Christian is concerned, 
we should be steadfast, not shaken in mind or troubled in spirit. That's easy to say. It's not so easy to practice. When life shows up, you know what it does? It wants to affect you in one of those two areas. Either your mind or your spirit. Both of those are pretty weak. He says in 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter 4, verse 7, 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. That is, you should have your eyes open. And as you go through life, you should be praying, interceding for what you see. Sometimes the thing to do is not open your mouth to the world, but open your mouth to God for what you see in the world. If you'll close your mouth, your eyes can open farther, usually. Look around. I, I like to people watch. You know what that is. You go to the mall and you watch people. You make up little stories about what they're doing and, you know, you're a detective. You can do that. But do that where it counts. God, that person looks like they're really bad. That person's got this problem or that problem. Identify it. Pray about it. God, I don't know what the situation is. You know what it is. That's a convicting thing for a Christian to do. He says, be sober. That is, stay off the alcohol. That's a convicting message for Christians nowadays. He says in Revelation 1, Revelation 1, verse 3. He says in Revelation 1, 3, Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, he says there's a special blessing if you'll read and obey. That's a twofold plan. You got to read it first, okay, that knocks out half of the Christians. You got to obey it, that knocks out seven eighths of the rest of them. <laughs> He says, read it and obey it. But when you do, you get a special blessing. And he says, here's the audience he's aiming this at. The Lord's coming back right at hand. That's where we are. We're setting right on the edge of this dispensation ending. And when it does, he says right here, I've got some things I'm doing. I'm pouring out a special blessing if these people will do this and this. Furthermore, he's going to give some special revelation at the end. We know that. There's more and more revelation the farther you get down the dispensation. Every dispensation has been that way. So he says, I'll dump it out on those who will be faithful. If you'll read and obey, you'll get the, the extra credit. <laughs> revelation 22, Revelation 22, verse 10. He says, <clears throat> and he said unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. That is, right at the end, he's got some, uh, he's going to throw the door wide open to understanding. Now, I don't know when that kicks in. Obviously, it hadn't right yet, because there's a lot of things I don't understand yet. <laughs> However, the farther we get down the line, he says, the more of it I'm going to start revealing. And the time is at hand. That is, grab it while you can, because soon it won't be available. Hmm. In conclusion, Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> Romans 10, verse 14. Romans 10, 14. Jesus called a handful of disciples, apostles, and then he gave them simple instructions and sent them out and said, go get it. Go do it. He says right here, Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him, on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That is, first a preacher, then a preaching, then hearing, then believing, then somebody's calling on the Savior because they recognize they're a sinner. That's the formula he's given. He says it starts right here, if you'll be willing to get out and go. The bread of life is as good today as it's always been. But preaching is the means of slicing it. That's putting it into bite-sized bits that a man can put on his plate. God said, or Jesus says, go out and preach. That's what I intend you to do. Your audience, he says, was as you go. That is, He's in control of who you see. Hmm. You didn't have control of that, but somebody did. God's setting up the audience. He's in control of all of that. He's got a convicting sermon that you've got to preach. That's the hard part. You're supposed to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is, you better get in now or the offer is no longer available. It's not forever. That's the same message God preached from the beginning of time all the way through. Remember what he told Adam? 
in the day you eat, you'll surely die. That is, the clock is ticking. There's an alarm clock. If it rings, time is up. The demand of a disciple is not difficult, yet most men can't handle the front lines. That's a fact. You know what happens when some people get on the front line? They uh, go into shock and they check out. You find out <clears throat> who's ready and who's not. Front ranks are not for the uh, kiddies. That's why Jesus only had 12 disciples. 12. Out of all of them, he could have had. Hundreds wanted to follow him from time to time, but only 12 would stick with him, and they didn't stick all the way either. Matthew 26. We've seen the demand of a disciple, but the fact is there's a great demand for a disciple because they're falling off day to day. Matthew 26, verse 55. In that same hour said Jesus unto the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hand on me, laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures might, uh, and of the prophets might be fulfilled. Watch what happened here. These were Jesus' disciples, been with him every day, 24-7. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. There's a great need for real disciples. By and large, they've all fled. Look around at Christendom. One after the other, the celebrity Christians that we thought were great are no longer. The contemporary music that's uh, pushed these um, celebrities have proved themselves to be as phony as we knew they were. Be a real disciple. It's going to be just... Uh, a small crowd of you, maybe only one of you. Just you and God. How about that one? Acts 13. Acts 13, 13. Acts 13, 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Pathos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John, that's John Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Here's what you find amongst most disciples. Is it's fine for a little while, but soon they're out. They check out. You know where he went? He went to Jerusalem. Wouldn't that be a good place to go? Most people won't stick with the hard stuff. Doesn't mean that they suddenly go to the nightclub. They just go somewhere it's comfortable. Jerusalem. Seems like that'd be a good place to go. But that wasn't working in the field. That wasn't getting anything done. He left the men who were doing the work out there. Went back to where it was comfortable in Jerusalem. Hmm. That's where most disciples fail, is no stick to in the rough stuff. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4. Paul says, 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Okay, that's a bad guy. And is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens unto Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. That is, they're not all bad. Only one of them went out into the world. He says, here's what's happening. They're all spread out. Your discipleship doesn't mean a big crowd. You'll find a few here and there. More than likely, you're going to be a Paul. If you're going to be a disciple, you're going to turn, determine it between you and God to do right, regardless of who's with you and who's not. In 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter 2, verse 13. 2 Peter 2, verse 13. We think of Paul as being harsh. Paul is milk toast compared to Peter when he gets mad. When Peter's on a rampage, he can let him have it. Second Peter 2, verse 13, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the day, uh, daytime. Spots are they, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you. That's most Christians, claiming to be followers of Christ, but not. Ponies, hypocrites, and, you know, that guy in the mirror. Look down at verse 15. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. That is, to be a disciple, it's going to require something of your day-to-day -day life. For Christian, our job is to follow the simple instructions of the Bible, and those are not something you make up or something you read when God says, read that, a Christian ought to do this. Read wherever God and however God shows you to read. There's no magic formula. The magic formula is the one he tells you to do. 
<laughs> do that one. And as you do that, he reveals scripture to you. Amen. And when he does that, it's simple instructions. And that you'll do, according to our verse, as you go.